Welcome to You Talking with Greg. I'm here with Tim Freak, um, who is an outstanding philosopher of spirituality. He's written over 35 books, uh, has been noted as one of the most influential spiritual people. Uh, so we are actually, we're, we're blessed with greatness here today and uh, on the program, you know, relative to who we normally get. Oh my gosh, right folks? We're going to be pretty <laughs> excited about that. Uh, Tim, it's really great to see you. Uh, it's good to see on. you again, Greg. Um, so, you know, you have a very rich, uh, fascinating life that I think is, um, you know, as we as we search for things that can help revitalize the human soul and spirit, which is a, a frame for this podcast. Um, can we just start a little bit with some introduction and a little bit of your journey? And uh, then we'll kind of quickly get into any number of different things like soul story or individual. I'll have to work on that. But anyway, yeah. Individualism. Just, uh, individualism. <laughs> Yep, That's there it, it is. You got it. <laughs> a couple there of practices. Um, well, uh, you know, I, 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 <laughs> I sometimes say, you know, I go by the name of a philosopher, but honest to goodness, really, I just think I'm, I just find this thing we're in incredibly mysterious. Yeah. I, you know, I, 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 ever since I've been a kid, it's been like, this is happening. Right. And every morning, this is happening. And... I'm aware that I'm aging and that I'm heading towards the exit. And I've been aware of that since I was very young as well. And so I think one of the major themes for me of, of being alive is just simply what the hell is going on and what should I do with it? Yep. Um, yeah. And the, the, the biggest turning point in that was very young for me. Honestly. Actually, can we just pause there for just a sec? Because actually, sure. I really, I think that if, well, for me, I'll speak for this, and because I, I didn't always have this, um, but the awe of existence itself um, is a, I mean, it's potentially horrifying at one level, but it is potentially one of the most beautiful, nourishing aspects of the soul spirit uh, that we really can tap. And I, and I really think it's, I think we do ourselves a disservice. Um, certainly people have noted this for a long time, but I think we're deeply underdeveloped in that awe and you exemplify that, you know, in, in your life and, and all that. So I just want to just note that. It, well, the thing which always astonishes me, Greg, I'm glad you picked up on that because it's a real passion of mine. I used to, I used to think um, I'm kind of in one of the phases of my, of my work. I used to think my job was just to sort of sneak up behind people and go, psst. Have you noticed you've got no idea what's going on? <laughs> what the fuck are we doing here? <laughs> yeah, because the thing which astonishes me because of my particular nature, I guess, mm -hmm. is how most of the time, uh, most of us go about our lives as if we do know what's going on. And as if we've got the whole thing sewn up and we know what really matters and what needs to be done and, and all the rest of it. And, and I, I, I don't know <laughs> why we do that. <laughs> <laughs> when we when we don't and for some reason i for some reason that was really obvious to me very young mm. so as a kid um i as a young mm. kid i i have i have memories and conversations i can remember one conversation with my father i must have been about nine mm. uh, of saying to him you know look asking him these questions out right, walking right. and him saying to me timothy wiser men than you or I have asked these questions and found no answers and and me thinking what? like really you know with that arrogance of youth I guess uh, mm. and thinking well, well I'm going to find an answer because how could there be a question this big right if there wasn't an answer this big huh. it, it, uh -huh. it must be and mm -hmm. and 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 that, so that's been, that's been like a really, wow. Yeah, that's really, so you really have a narrative arc to your story. That's really tied deeply right into this issue. Okay. Yeah, I think so. I think that's been, and, and, and there's, there's good things about that, mm -hmm. um, which hopefully I can share a few of the good yes. things, but, Amen. but also, you know, it's like one of the things I, I, I think for my life story has been that it also disconnects you. So, mm. I mean, it was true of a lot of my generation, our generation, mm. but, 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 for me, it was like immediately looking at the world and professionalism or even having a, you yep. know, getting into a c academia and it just felt like, why would, what? <laughs> you know, it's this, I was much more inclined to think that if I was going to do anything that was right. um, 
focused in that way yep. it would be becoming a monk or you know right right something like that because it was like what what can lead to understanding what this is totally what, what what's going to do that um and and then the, and so the big moment i'll just share this with you because it's the kind of like the seed like carl mm. Jung says there's, there's sometimes yep. a seed to a life sure and i think this is the seed was sitting on this little hill i lived in a very ordinary town in the west country of england okay. and we used to sit on this hill with my dog and looking at the mm-hmm. little town everyone rushing mm-hmm. around mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. sort of being busy and not thinking about the fact they were going to die and <laughs> and 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 that kind of like why does nobody what are you doing not thinking about nobody, the fact i'm going to die know, like, <laughs> that's like, what i'm doing my parents never <laughs> mention it's a mystery why do my teachers never m- mention mm. it's a mystery why amazing it's, like this, it's not just an elephant in the room it's like a whole herd of elephants in the room and <laughs> Uh, and then something happened for the first time, which I now think of as becoming deep awake. And so uh, it, uh, uh, quite a sudden shift, I, which I d- did write about I was even then. Right. And what happened in that, in that experience was this, uh, this jump into this sense of communion, all the classic things, mm. and an extraordinary love, like the whole universe is wow. pulsating with love. And what that set me off on, I mean, because it didn't last very long, I don't suppose, but it really made a big impact, was, oh, maybe the big answer to the big question isn't a set of words, it's a type of experience. And that's been like, I think, the thread which has (sighs) run through it. Beautiful. How old were you, Pell, when this happened? Late 12, just about 12. 12. (laughs) Yeah. I guess you are an early spiritual bloomer. (laughs) <laughs> yeah i mean i've i don't know why I, it's really I mean, fascinating yeah, yeah. so that, i can relate to that in a in a slightly um i'm later you know maybe 27 and and i ask a slightly different question but it then backs me into i think a kindred spirit in a deep way and that was um, i'm getting into this all learning how to do psychotherapy and then it was like you know like learning all these different methods of psychotherapy and i've been sold on sort of behavioral science you know it's like oh science knowledge all this other stuff i'm like wait a minute there are all these different things and then i was like shouldn't we organize them by the science of psychology okay and i've been trained in psychology when you get trained in psychology you actually get trained in the methods of behavioral science okay and you actually get psychology really is framed as an epistemology basically that you apply the methods of science to whatever this thing is okay but when i came back after doing psychotherapy, I didn't need the epistemology. I needed the ontological knowledge about from the discipline. Okay. So I then asked it from a different question. I was like, well, what is psychology for this? And then I realized nobody knows what psychology is. (laughs) Okay. There isn't any ontology to the field at all that anybody agrees on. And then I look back, it's like, we know this, like, like, but nobody said anything. <laughs> like nobody, when they, you know, be a scientist and they just said, as if you parrot the methods, we'll be okay. And just keep doing methods. And it's like, we don't know what we're talking about. <laughs> and so, so anyway, I relate deeply then to this, like, I, I why think, aren't we talking about this? <laughs> I think there's a common, there. It, it is, I think this is a, I mean, I had my own particular version and you've had, mm-hmm. you had a, a, a different one, but there's that. I think there's happens, it's still happening, actually happening a lot recently, where you wake up from something, where yes. you suddenly see, even you know whether you're 12, 27, mm-hmm. or 60 something, it's like you suddenly go, oh, I, I, I was, I was experiencing not just seeing it or thinking about it, although partly that, right, but actually right. experiencing life as if it right. is this, and I've assumed that, is it? And then suddenly it opens up a opportunity to experience it in a completely different way totally the, i would say it in terms of sort of the the frames of justification that i've just been taking as assumptions you know and i'm yeah. operating off and then they get weaker and weaker and then all of a sudden you like ask a particular question a particular way and you're like oh my god the whole frame really is it's just a constructed structure yeah. that doesn't address the core and now yeah. you're like wait a minute where am i relative to everybody else yeah yeah <laughs> yeah exactly exactly yeah so, so I can really relate to that. And, and, and that's still going on. I mean, I, I, I'm probably having that more now than ever, um, which is both exciting and slightly, if I'm honest, it's kind of slightly, um, I want to say humbling, but it's probably humiliating that to be in my 60s and see, noticing things that I 
hadn't noticed for the whole of my mm. life. It's like, yeah. oh wow, this is tricky stuff, isn't it? To yeah. really, to really. But the good thing is, it, it opens up more of more a, a deeper understanding of this mysterious business. Totally, and I, and I love and, it. And I think your journey has yielded some really good nuggets and and some things. So maybe we can shift into that and tell a little bit about what you what that's been like and some of the key well, if I, if nuggets I, or findings or anything if, like that. If I if I was going to describe the 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 philosophy side of 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 my life, right. um, it, there's been the kind of like a, it's been about trying to. Uh, trying to studying all the different spiritual traditions of the world mm. to begin with really okay. great experientially mm-hmm. and yep. and and then writing books on them really going oh hang on these are all at root people like you and me who've one day had what happened to me on the mm-hmm. hill in their own unique way or, right. and followed it through mm. and so there's a commonality mm. so that kind of perennial philosophy idea yeah yep. was the starting mm. place i now actually feel i feel i now feel like actually that whole perennial philosophy is only a stage mm. or i think it's a stage of understanding that humanity went through around the axle age and thereafter rather right. than you know it nice. <laughs> right, and if right, we could right. just get back to it i don't <laughs> think that now i i because i think in evolutionary ways so i think it was a i think it was a phase yes so so i so that was a phase for me mm-hmm, and then mm-hmm. from that became oh well how would we understand that now because all mm. of the of my heroes in that process had all articulated a new form of spirituality, mm. really. And it's like, what would it be now to do that? And how can I do mm. that? And then mm. this last phase, when you talk about univigilism, has been, uh, okay, so maybe, maybe we need a radical uh, restatement. And the biggest thing for me, you know, you talked about being 27 and science mm-hmm. and, 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 mm-hmm. and entering that world. Mm-hmm. I really didn't. Because, and I don't, I, you know, this is the way I was thinking then, not now. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But, you know, from school onwards, I, it just felt like science was about how things work. I'm not interested. Hmm. And, uh, mm-hmm. you know, it's iron filings. And, you know, it's like, <laughs> really? Is that going to give me, is that going to show me the meaning of existence? I don't right, think so. Yeah, it's yeah. moving on. You know, it's like, I'm glad somebody's doing it. Because I right, like my right, right. work, but I'm, I can't be asked with that. And then over the last 20 years, actually, I've fallen in love with it because I've understood it. Mm -hmm. And suddenly I've realized the the, the immense body of knowledge, which has been built up. And that's me. And I see it dominating more and more and more in culture for Mm -hmm. good and for ill. The good side being the breadth, the depth of the knowledge of the, the most elementary levels of uh, existence, the physical, the biological, Mm -hmm. and then an ignoring in some profound way, not, you know, psychology as it's seen in science is kind of like, yeah, it's there. And then you hit these other things, like someone saying, what happens when that, you know, it's like, well, so, you're deluded, or you've had some yep. psychotic episode, which could be true, but I don't think so. But, mm. you know, I stay open. Mm-hmm. I might be just psychotic, but I don't think so. No, I... And so how can we weld all that together? How is there a narrative that could have a stab at holding it all into one integral story. And I think for me, the thing which I'm attempting is to say, I think it, it's the evolutionary narrative. I mm. think that's the story which stands a chance of pulling it all together because it's the process of time through which everything has emerged. Beautiful. If it's so, so interesting to talk to you. Um, and so, yeah, let's, uh, we've got a lot to cover, but I'll just hit a couple of things. So, your narrative and mine almost then are like kind of going in because so for me it's like oh science okay science gives us real knowledge and then i got raised in the new atheist tradition of people used to believe in god and all that stuff you know (laughs) right and then it's like i get in there and then you actually also because i want to be a clinician too so i'm very concerned with the embodied experience of living and dealing with suffering and human value and then i back into this and then i find the inadequacies of science and then I start to expand and move into philosophy. And now I'm like, oh, oh my gosh, the concept of God is really important in spirituality. <laughs> and how do we embrace, you know, the existence and, and this modernity thing's got the equations all wrong. <laughs> and so there's a lot of interesting um, sort of like, you know, parallel yin yang in terms of our journeys in relationship to that. That is interesting. That is interesting. So, so was, why did that happen? Do you think, Greg, what was it that, 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 that brought you out of that? that culture of 
you know, yep. we've got it all wrapped up and it's science. Well, I mean, uh, certainly the journey that I went on in building what now become you talk, you know, the unified theory of knowledge uh, is definitely, and a lot of that is then situated on the profound limitations. So there's all this profound power, uh, basically, in science, especially yep. if they, the physical, chemical, into biological, into neuroscience, you take a left turn on computer science, blah, blah, blah. And then my experience and claim is actually something fundamentally happens at psychology. Okay. Like there's a qualitative shift in the nature of knowledge, scientific knowledge, when we get to this thing called psychology. And, and the reason is because we actually have a reasonably different ontological picture. Um, uh, well, although it's limited, we have an ontological picture of how we go to particles to atoms into then cells and then nervous systems and then animals running around. Okay. There's that. And then all of a sudden we're here as subjects and we're reflecting and you get the human sciences, what the hell, and we can apply the methods, but we really don't have the language. Okay. I call that the enlightenment gap basically is sort of, um, and then I found at least what I think is a way to solve the ontology of what psychology is trying to do. And then you rotate that. And then all of a sudden knowledge comes online in particular. And it's like, Oh my God, we're framing this all wrong. This this, you know, this way of thinking about psyche, the being of, of, you know, we can bridge to the wisdom traditions, this idea that spirituality and, you know, and transcendence are these psychotic things or are these just sort of like, you know, silly things. It's just fundamentally gets the human psychic structure wrong. Um, and it's, it's actually killing us mentally, at least the mental meaning health crisis that John talks about, I certainly have seen. And so we are actually the soul is being shrunk and starved by a modernity that is fundamentally miscalculates and misframes what its essence is in relationship to what its potential. It, it is literally soul destroying. Yeah. It, 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 and, and so, so for so. me, I think the, the, and, and so we got to evolve differently, Tim, we need to we evolve, evolve differently. We, you know, it, <laughs> it, 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 the, I think, I think the, the root of that the 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 see the i see is is reductionism is that idea that you can reduce the more emergent to the less emergent oh, right. and i think that's fundamentally wrong so that if you have a if you because because essentially what you know putting it very crudely obviously you know mm -hmm. if you know that means psychology is basically just a, a side effect of biology and so why not go straight to biology and biology is a side effect of physics. So, totally. and, and, and down and down you go, and then you're going to get a theory of everything apparently, which is a, a formula about physics. <laughs> and that's going to explain Beethoven and rock and roll and it's absolutely absurd. And, you know, it's like, it's, but if you have a, if you have an, a, the, if you see emergent, an emergent idea as the opposite of that, yep. oh, I've gone all out of focus. Hello. I don't know what that is. <laughs> Hopefully I'll come back into focus. I'm going out of focus. Um, the if if you if you see emergentism as the opposite of, of, of that, that's what I've been trying to build up with it on a metaphysical level. Perfect. And so crudely, I would, you know, just saying it quickly. Yeah. For me, it's like if it, it, it's I think it's quite it turns out, I think, quite similar to um Charles Sanders' purse, uh, mm. actually. I'm doing because I'm trying to get that to come into yeah, focus. That's and I don't okay. know why not. <laughs> Most people are just listening. The, to the, way, so. the um, uh, so I would see. Look, what, what what is the commonality of everything? What what is if if this is if you have an intuition, which I have, and I think most people living in science have, is that this fundamental existence is a unity. It's a one. Mm -hmm. It's a it's a whole. What is the quality that everything shares? And the quality that everything shares, I suggest, is is existing being. So, okay. you, so we can imagine just philosophically a field mm -hmm. of being which mm -hmm. is informed in various nice. ways, Beautiful. and is it, and and around me everything is that information. Whether it's oh. what I'm seeing or feeling, everything is a form of information. My thoughts, everything is yep. a form of information. Love it. And the key, so that, so that, so that my fundamental uh, idea that I'm trying to make work would be this. Is existence this a, is it the one in relationship with itself? Yep. In a process of, in the process of realizing more emergent potentials. Love it. Yep. Including everything, mm -hmm. literally everything that has yep. form. In which case, 
and this is the the thing I think Peirce started off is in which case uh, there are there are no given laws of nature. They themselves has mm. evolved, and they are more like what well, he calls them habits. Habits, um, yep. Um, but you can you know like algorithms or something. So you've got a learning machine, a learning machine, a learning process which is then forming these fundamental uh, repetitive ordering principles. Once you have that, it's like, well, the ground is, is completely potentiality and it's never fully conditioned. So that rather than it being like, well, the conditioning's there and then everything just it, it echoes out like a machine, yep. actually there's creativity and what I call passivity, the influence of the past repeating yep. okay. I like in everything. That. <laughs> Yeah. In, and totally. and which, which means that it, and, and the cutting edge of that is always the most emergent. So yeah. around me here, the least emergent is physics. So, yeah. I, you know, I'm pretty sure that's going to drop. Oh, it mm. did. I'm pretty sure it'll drop again. Oh, it did. I have no idea what you're going to say next. Ah. That's on a really emergent level. And totally. that's where the creativity shows up, Love because it. that's not just the past, the past repeating. 100 percent. So, uh, yeah, that's just why I was looking forward to ch chatting. Uh, you know, that, that, that essentially is, is what emerged in me. In fact, the, in night, when I was, so I had went on this quest and then I had an insight about sort of the emergence of how we go from primates to persons, okay? Uh, which is this idea of justification, really. It's not language per se, but it's like, ooh, actually what happens is the structure and functional language is this issue of justification. Okay, I had this insight in 1996. And then after that, I have this insight of this thing called the tree of knowledge, um, which is a picture of big history emergence. Okay, and it's emergence of complexification that from matter to life to mind to culture. Okay, and, it, and although it's, it, it connects to the idea of an underlying continuity, you know, that is good, what some people like Dan Dennett call good reductionism, it says this is an entirely contingent process of creation and feedback loops, you know? Um, and it affords us a way of thinking about this exactly as that there was actually jumps in evolutionary em emergence of information processing. Like life is a kind of information processing and mind mediated by the nervous system, the kind of information processing and subject of consciousness. And then justification language is kind of information. So we're like these energy information fields that are dynamically evolving in an energy information stack. And now we can achieve awareness of that stack. And then that's gonna, holy, you know, holy shit, <laughs> you know? Yeah, I, I very, very, you know, I resonate with, with, with that very much. So I, I think that, that, that is the, the possibility of pulling all this together. Now for me, and I don't know, you know, for me, it's like, having spent most of my life exploring these altered states, mm. I take them very, very seriously because I've had them so much. And right. what intrigues me about the whole thing is it's, is how profoundly it alters my experience of life. And so I'm, I have other problems, not problems, but other <laughs> things that I want to understand. Mm. Um, so, so I take very seriously um, for instance, is an easy one, what Carl Jung called synchronicities. Yeah. So, uh, because mm -hmm. I just had so many magical events. And so, so there's kind of two things there. One is, oh, I want to say something else which was related to earlier and then pick that up. I wanted to mm -hmm. say, when you talked about like with John Vivaki and the meaning crisis and all that, yeah. it feels like one of the things with reductionism is that obviously there's no meaning. Meaning yeah. is, a, you know, if there's life and you add meaning and you make it up. And it's yep. like, but if you have this version, it's the opposite. It's like, yeah, first you had chemicals and then you had life and, and then meaning emerged. Yes. And now it's not an extra. It's, no. the, it's the leading edge of the whole damn thing Love is it. that the universe has become meaningful. And, and the universe has now worked out a way to have a conversation right now in which totally. it's going, what do you think I am? Huh. <laughs> <laughs> how do we get here what should and, we do and, and what, I, what what should i be doing and, and it's like that's what else you know because we are the universe talking to itself what else could we be it's like Amazing. we come from somewhere else so yeah. we are that having a com so it has got to the point where it's having a conversation with itself about what it is totally and then on top of that 
there's this element where life itself, the actual narrative that happens, mm -hmm. starts becoming dreamlike mm. and plays out these synchronous events or these narrative events. And then, so then it's like, well, what the hell's that? How mm. could that be possible? Because within the model that we've got dominant at the moment, that's just impossible. Yeah. That's just, that's, that's fanciful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't seem fanciful. So when I get that, it's like, well, I'm going to go with my life experience and not the model. Yep. And, and I'm looking for a new model, mm -hmm. which means that the evolutionary process certainly doesn't stop at biology. Yep. Goes right into the psyche, the soul, yep. mm -hmm. and then goes, what the hell is the psyche and the soul exactly? Mm -hmm. Is it just mm -hmm. a byproduct of the brain or is it a level that's emerged from it? Totally. Which, which is uh, which is having a very profound effect. So, yep. in other words, ha has has the universe actually kind of evolved into a story? Yes, I totally believe that it has. I totally. So, I mean, that's it's, a very that's completely. So, I mean, the tree of knowledge basically says uh, that here's the version the tree of knowledge tells. Okay, uh, so it says that yes, life emerges out of matter, and we don't really know exactly how, but we know. It gets knitted together, or at least it's the claim, that gets knitted together through an information processing communication network. Okay? Yep. And then I argued that that information processing communication network is not reducible to physics because yep. the forms are having causation exactly. through the information processing communication. And you cannot turn those into the microscopic particle moving around because the actual gestalt forms that the organism's interpreting and, and it, it really does, it coarse grains from the beginning and then creates a form of that on a semantic schematic and then boom. And I believe that you can more or less model cells that way. And definitely and then you evolve and then there are all these different kingdoms, but one of them is the animal kingdom and it starts getting up and moves around and it needs a nervous system to coordinate and map the entire body of the whole in relationship in what John would call the agent arena relationship. And I would then say these are then minded creatures which is a second dimension on top of life. So the mental life is inside of here. And when consciousness or experiential and what that is, we can talk about out of frame for, you know, when that arrives. But at a, I argue we should call, when we look and see an insect flying around, we should call that mental behavior, okay? And know that, and you can call that actually mind or a minded animal, all right? So that changes your vocabulary a little bit. But now what that means is, we can actually say, oh, there's mind, okay? Which is an interesting, from a scientific perspective, that's an interesting move, I can get into why. But ultimately then you can follow the evolution of minded animal behaviors all the way up to primates, okay? Uh, and then we as unique primates start syncing together as a whole group. Uh, Michael Tomasello talks about all of a sudden capacity for shared attention, intention. Yep. And then of course we start talking and justifying. And then how do we create shared meaning? I call these systems of justification that are basically justification narratives, okay? And now we're trying to figure out, because we're actually, what happens is once we get justification, then we ask questions, why? Why do this? Why do that? Why, daddy? <laughs> do all this stuff? And you're like, well, and you have to then build that. And now we're, now we're at this cusp of seeking a story for where we are. And the universe is now talking to itself and being like, really at a point of potential awakening, that then is sitting now seeking sort of this grand narrative story that it tells of itself of how it came to be. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I don't understand all of that, Greg, because I'd have to study your work in far more well, detail than I have yet. Um, but I understand enough of it to go, yeah, I really, I really resonate that. So I have this, um, uh, my attention of late the last few years yes, has been please. really to root back into metaphysics to mm. justify because because I really want to step in and go look that stuff that's being dismissed as woo woo it isn't a lot of it is I live in you know a lot of spirituality is woo woo but but some of it is really not mm. and uh, and that needs a strong foundation so one of the ideas that I'm that I take very seriously is 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 this idea that um the past hasn't mm -hmm. passed it's mm -hmm. accumulated mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that the universe is a process okay. it's a kind of a process philosophy i guess i, yep. I yep. didn't i didn't know that when i started working <laughs> yeah. on it. you're, you're a new it's, whitehead 
<laughs> yeah, I, I, it's like really, I, I, my own, because of my own way I work, I find out these people like Person Whitehead later and go, mm. oh look, he's already said this. <laughs> and but th this idea that it's a process, and process is kind of made of time, mm. and that that I, I'm very intrigued by this idea that everything that's come into form, all the information that has come into form, is formed, mm -hmm. and is therefore forming the what I would call the passivity or the it's forming the the, the patterns that are running everything. Nice. So everything's being run by the past, like as it were. There's very there's there's Rupert Sheldrake talks about this sort of thing, yep. but also um, um, the physicist Lee Smolin. Has ah, been talking mm -hmm, about this recently. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, he's R Rupert's been doing it for years, but mm -hmm. Lee's quite new, I think, in saying it. But he calls it the power of precedence. That what mm -hmm. that these that this is his attempt to try and in the same do the same thing of going look, the so-called laws of nature. That whole metaphor of a law mm -hmm. that's a leftover mm -hmm. from a creator god who mm -hmm. who declares mm -hmm. these are the laws, and it's like mm -hmm. oh, that's mm -hmm. gone. Mm -hmm. These are these are mm. so that there, there's a there's a lot the brilliant. Um, paper I came across earlier this year, I think it was in the spring, called The Autodidactic Universe of 14 Physicists, including yeah. Lee Smolin, mm. who go, look, this is learning. Mm. And I think the way it's learning is that the information that forms the past is a bit like David Bohm's mm -hmm. um, uh, implicate order. It's forming yep. the implicate order that's running the mm. explicate world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and a, a thing I've been playing with in my mind of, of, of how to visualize that mm -hmm. is thinking, you know, taking the 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 um, the, um, uh, the, the 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 genetic tree that's in biology yep. of species mm -hmm. and applying it to the whole universe. Mm -hmm. going, well, look, if you if you imagine that process. Mm. I think of it like an infogenetic tree. It's yep. like all of these different info systems have arisen at different times and on different levels. And then, like you said, they're running. Each information system, each new emergent system emerges from the less emergent, mm -hmm. less emergent. But now its role is to organize the less emergent. Mm -hmm. That's what it does. Mm -hmm. It is more than. Mm -hmm. that's, that's why it's emergent. And it totally. organizes. So when you talked about, this is why I, I mentioned it, because when you talk about the body, it felt like, yeah, that's that's what something I think you're you're saying something I'm seeing as well, which yep, is totally there is a level of organization, which is the body. And it's not this. Mm. It's what's organizing this. Yes. It's not made of cells, which is why cells yep. come and go all the time. Yep. It, it's a level of information that organizes cells. That's what it is. Yep. And then cells are a level of information that organize chemicals yep. and chemicals are a level. In, and they're all organizing so that instead of all the causation going upwards, it's like there's this huge downward, downward causation, yep, which is actually running the show, and that's happening now on a psychological level because I'm amazingly intending my mouth to move. I don't know how it does it, yep, and shooting off these funny sounds full of information to you, totally, and, I, and that's so, this uh, well, psychology yep. as a higher level. Yeah, so actually, the, so this is so I'm now working this out in a particular way that's going to I think resonate very well with you. So. Um, so this question of what this information layer is and how it gets stacked um, is I'm working out whether or not I can model. In fact, this is embedded in the tree of knowledge diagram and it's visual logic, okay? Is I believe that what, what emerges at least say at life and then at mind it at culture, okay? Are these um, informational networks, okay? That are essentially recursively modeling patterns and storing them to, to basically solve problems like neg entropy and equilibrium, meaning the models is flowing the information. And then it builds this network of like kind of semantic informational organization. And that's the thing that's organizing the structure. Okay. And I believe that the relationship between this is very much akin to the relationship between real numbers and imaginary numbers. Ooh. Okay. So I don't, uh, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, I mean, the, anyway, this is this is cool. Okay, so this is uh, does that mean? so uh, so imaginary numbers when they imaginary numbers are square root of negative one. That's yeah. what an imaginary number is. Okay, yeah. and when mathematicians came across it, of course, the the laws of squaring is that a negative one times negative one is one. You can't get a negative square root. Okay, so at first they just threw it out. All right. And then it kept popping up. They were trying to solve problems in what's called a cubic square and blah, blah, blah. And then this is the 15th century, 16th century. And here's what ultimately it emerges is that 
It's an orthogonal 90 degree perpendicular relationship, okay, that they then are able to specify with mathematical, you know, logic precision. So that now an imaginary number is just is defined as orthogonal to the real 90 degrees. If you multiply by I, you rotate it. You multiply by I squared, you rotate it again. You multiply by I, and ultimately I to the fourth, then circles back around as one, okay? And then this creates what's called the complex grid. So that a number, a one, one I is now a complex number that then can be mapped. And then like my son, who's a math major, takes a whole course on complex numbers, okay? And he's like, dad, you don't know how to do this? I'm like, no, I don't. But I do know <laughs> the graph of a complex number. And I studied the way they understood the dimension, okay, of imaginary relative to real and it's orthogonal. Here's what happened. I was, I had this idea of a while ago, but then I connected with John, you know, okay? John Verveke, all right? And then John has introduced me to this whole, actually, concept of the imaginal, all right? So the imaginal loosens imaginary. You have imaginary, and imaginal is what sort of you think about what's possible, okay? So it creates an intermediate. And then the way in which imaginal really works is, oh, it's really useful to engage in imaginal. That's what we're doing all the time when we're anticipating what might happen and playing out various scenarios, Okay. Now, if we think about it this way, then it's like, well, okay, imagine when I play out scenarios, what's actually happening when I grab a cup? Well, I actually have a, the virtual experience, which is sort of an imaginal virtual representation of the cup, that one way of thinking about it. The tightness, we can say, oh, I have an accurate representation because I can move it around. So now we can create a dimension. My inner experience is this imaginal virtual dimension, some of it which has tightness, meaning that there's a correspondence and we can then show by a complex dynamic interaction that I can lift it up and drink. And then that's got a complex flavor into the real world, which you can then any independent person say, okay, this has mass and we drop it. It's going to break and do all the things that a scientist could intersubjectively agree on to be exist in the real world, independent of my image of it. Okay. So the bottom line is this, I'm working on whether or not the informational stack of a subject and the way it construes the world can be thought of as an imaginal representation of the real world. So that that's an orthogonal, inter complex interacting structure that actually has deep, at least useful and maybe deep parallels with the way mathematicians thought about imaginary and real. And if that's the case, then we may have a way of really articulating this relationship in a metaphysically clear way. That's very interesting. I'd need to think about that quite a lot. I really, I like it at, at the very least, I like it as an analogy. It's an analogy um, that, that, that we're finding out how much <laughs> that um, analogy works. And I certainly, I would certainly, I mean, I, the, 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 I don't know if this will resonate with what you're mm -hmm. saying. It's, it doesn't, it's not using the mathematical analogy, but it's kind of similar, I think, I think, is that you see, I, I, I really want to push the boat because for me, I, it, because of my agenda has also got yeah, the spiritual yeah. dimension to it. So, so it feels like, look, the less, the, le the more emergent emerges from the less emergent totally. and then takes on its own uh, level within the infogenetic tree, if you like. Yes, the, exactly. So <laughs> that, so that, so that, um, that the, 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 there's a level in which there is a uh, processing happening neurologically which has so an, a neurological network mm -hmm. has at some process i spent well before human beings turned into an a, what i like an ideational yes network. totally and increasingly that ideational network has taken off on its own yes so that to, I, it feels like th this is a whole domain now uh, right. I, I also call it imaginal. I, in fact, I sometimes call it the imaginos, the yeah. idea that there's a cosmos and an imaginos, because I think there's what spirituality has always has, has been about and still is, is actually, you know, psychonauts. It's been like going yeah. off into that. Right. And coming back going, it's big. <laughs> yes. There's something out there. <laughs> there's, yeah. there's, it's like, I found no limit to it. And, and so that there's a domain now. And it can't be reduced to this domain, and it, because it, the more emergent cannot be reduced to the less emergent. Okay. So that 
So that is at each level, just like, okay, the body is a system of organization, which has arisen from cells, but isn't cells. Yep. And, and then the, the imaginal has arisen from the, ne the neurological network, but it isn't just that. It totally. is also more than that, um, that that domain over the last period of human development has really gone. Oh, exactly. And that's what we're exploring now. Yep. by sharing these abstract totally. ideas. And it's also what you can actually go off into, and people have been doing it for, from shamanic times. 100%. Indeed, why and my dog, Benji, may wander around here, okay? So, and, you know, he, this, this conversation is in an imaginal propositional network dimension, which I call the culture person plane of existence that he, he can't pl plug in. He's heard me have these conversations. He still is not following. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And yet you and I living in totally different worlds can immediately yeah. sync up and be like, oh, I understand what you're existing in this imaginal propositional network space, right? Yeah. I, can just, I can tap right into you and yeah. afford that particular kind of complex yeah, and, interaction. And, and it's huge, isn't it? Huge. Sort of it's, it's unbelievable. And then we could just stop all of this and we could share poetry. And that yeah. would make sense. Or, or, or music. Like, wow. Right. You could hear no, funny No, it's an amazing thing. And just go, I know, I like, I understand those mm -hmm. funny sounds. Right. It, it, it's a big dimension. And it is the root of culture. I mean, the thing which, I, I, you know, I love the obvious things. They blow me away. I just love it. Like looking at, looking at your, uh, your picture here, I'm thinking, <laughs> hmm. Apart from your body, which is itself covered up with all sorts of clothes, mostly, and got glasses on, every single thing I can see has been through the imagination. Totally. We're living inside it. Yeah. We've, we've taken the world and, and turned it into the imagination. Yes, amen. Amen. And, and amen. It's, it's all about narrative. It's all about meaning. That, that is the thing which has emerged. And, and, and to get conscious of that and to understand what that is, is absolutely, the, to me, the central metaphysical problem. We yeah, to, you know. yeah. I mean, I'm, there's a there's a bit of a silly metaphor, I guess, but I kind of it amuses me. But in one of my books, I put it. It's like it felt like my problem with the dominant mindset that I see around science, even though mm -hmm. I love and respect it so much. It, the, the metaphor that came to me one day is: it feels like you've got a, you know, this is the old days when you had DVDs. But, you know, you've got a DVD of a movie, and you and you give it to your scientist friend, and go, yeah, "Tell me what you make of that." And they go away, and they come back. You said, "Yeah, what did you think?" And they go, "Oh, yeah, no, it was great. I looked at it, and it's digital information encoded on a disc." Right. And you go, but what, what did you what did you make of the story? <laughs> <laughs> totally. And it's, that's exactly and it's right. That, it's like, look, it's yep. the story. That's the whole point. It is digital information on a disc. That's right. But it's there because it's the story. Right. And so it's the story of 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 Greg. It's the story of Tim. It's the story of us that that's it's been right. into. And yep. that's not like whoa, some weird side effect of physics. That is, that is the most emergent thing that's going on in our neck of the universe. Totally. And it's to me the way that what what. So first we had billiard balls, right? In physics, yeah, uh, yeah, right? Yeah. Basically. Yeah. <laughs> and we got billiard balls. We nailed I got them. Taught billiard balls at school. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, there you go. And then, then we get the 20th century revolution, right? Where we drop into energy information, quantum field theory down the road. And then general relativity says actually it all can then sink back into a big bang singularity eventually. So you get this, oh, underneath this matter, three dimension space, it's not all clockwork and it's actually an energy information field. So we do that. And then we also get then information theory, you know, uh, we then link that up with entropy and they get information theory and the artificial intelligence where they get logical algorithmic syntax. Okay. But the metaphysics of physics is still like, okay, we can just run computation through algorithms. Okay. Or just have cause effect in lawful predetermined ways. They don't know how to generate semantic understanding the semantic network that actually then becomes the intelligible organization of the field. And there's physics just doesn't know how to frame that at all. And then they say, they tell you that, mm, but actually I'm like, no, actually this, inf this is what emerges is this network of informational processing that emerges. And it is this network that we have to get a handle on. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that is definitely, and I think it is moving. Um, oh, I do. Yeah, I think to, we're... Um, uh, because it has to, and I think there there will be a whole new paradigm 
at some point soon, whether it'll be in my lifetime, I, I don't know, but it will be soon. And uh, because it needs to, because it, because it, this one is, is so out of date and totally. it's out of date by its own. It, no, it's, it's a, yeah, it, I mean, it's, it's a classic Cooney and paradigm structure thing. You're looking and at I, it and I, like, I think, I think the idea of the law is key to it because mm. it's obvious. It's like the whole metaphor is flawed. It's like it, uh, we, we've let go of the idea of a lawmaker at the beginning of the universe. <laughs> It's, so there are no laws. What do you mean? It's like, it, and then the opportunity to go, look, what science has done, which is blown me away, is understood the universe as a process and, a, and, and, and got a handle on how old that process might be in our universe, oh. at least. I mean, that's a phenomenal achievement. Yep. And I'm sure it will change, but it, it's, it's huge. So the idea then of going, OK, well, let's actually take that seriously. Because that means everything is one process, everything. Totally. So there's no laws and 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 what I love about quantum physics, you know, is is that you get. It looks like that the earliest layers in that process mm -hmm. are probabilities; they're mathematical, and that it looks like those probabilities become actualities when they come into contact with more emergent levels. Totally, so everything is relational. Time is relational. Space Love is relational. It. Energy yep. is relational. Everything's the one in relationship to itself, taking on all of these different forms through relationship from a mathematical through to a physical, through to a life, through to psyche and, and maybe beyond. And uh, it, you, you've suddenly got this beautiful vision, which puts your human experience not as a meaningless dot in a vast empty universe, but as the most emergent thing that we're aware of, it, at the end of and the culmination and the fruit of this extraordinary process. Love that. So that's the individual. Let me just throw that Oh, in. well, okay. okay. I was just about ready to ask you. I was like, okay, is this, oh, that's unbelievable. Is, is, okay. my, is my word, you know, wanting to go, going back to my experience when I was 12, you know, it's all one, you know, mm -hmm. that kind of like, what. So I, I, that's what, I, what I've spent a lot of time doing um, in those, my decades right. has been introducing people to the experience of waking up to oneness and that enormous right. love and that shift that happens. And suddenly you're in a different world. And I've seen thousands of people all over the world now have that happen. And the, the traditional spirituality, which I'm the kind of world that I've come from, sees the individual as an impediment mm. it's all one and what stands in the way is yourself greg and if you could just get over your ego and get rid of yourself right then you'd be enlightened and you could get out of this shithole and you'd never have to come back because this is an illusion and you've got mm -hmm. caught up in it i'm i'm characterizing it you know yeah no i mean I, i'm following so I've, I've heard that message essentially before. that's the message <laughs> that's and a lot thinking because that's your mind and basically and your emotions and your attachments basically everything mm -hmm. that makes you a human being is the problem and then you can realize you can have be enlightened or realize your god or whatever the particular version is and for me i think that's fundamentally mistaken and it seems to me that actually the individual has been what it's all been heading to the the conscious individual and that it's through the individual that if you like the universe can realize it's one wow. and that so that far from being an impediment it's the foundation and that's what I mean by a individual, an individual who's conscious of unity. And that's what I think is, could wow. be the Holy. next, the next evolutionary. That, that is super fascinating. I love that. Um, especially if actually, um, if you get individuals who have this individual experience connecting, right. To create exactly. then exactly. a particular exactly type that. of collective. Right. And, and, and I think, OK, I'm going to really push the boat now. All right. One of the things for me in my journey, right from mm -hmm. when I was 12 and on and off, you know, in different ways all the way yep, through, yep. is that this powerful sense for me that there is something beyond me, yep. by which I mean something more emergent than mm -hmm. I am. Mm -hmm. And the traditional name that would be given for that experience is God. Yep. Now, God has gone a long time ago as, I, you know, the, the caricature, silly ideas of God, but also just anything. You know, if you put God at the beginning, you've solved nothing. You've just put a big mystery at the beginning. So that's useless to me. 
it's like the and, and he's a monster as well because like you know this like how could it be and nuts you know <laughs> you know it's just, well, how many billion years million yeah. years do we have of dinosaurs it's yeah. like any god at the beginning is a monstrous nut job so that's not what i'm experiencing and but i'm playing with this other possibility because it works for me which is that actually when we do come into that experience of oneness mm -hmm. that the psyche or the soul is mm -hmm. actually coming into communion with others in that state mm -hmm. and that just as the body is a more emergent system which unifies mm -hmm. different cells and each cell's got really no idea what it's like to be tim but they're all part of tim that actually the psyches um that come into that state of unity start forming a higher information system a unisoul if you like yes. which is experienced as something utterly benign and all-encompassing and there's an and and i don't really know what it's like to be it any more than the cell knows what it's like to be tim but what i know what it's like to commune in it right. and it feels like this immense love and this oceanic oneness and this sense of great uh, uh, beneficence benevolence that's so, striking man. So that's really saying, you know it, it, it put it in, to put it in provocative language I'm kind of suggesting that God's not where it come from, but it's where it's going totally. and that the universe is flowering into this higher level of which I get to be a part. Um, like other I mean, things. That's, are part that's basically the exact vision vision that evolved in me. It's <laughs> really amazing. <laughs> that's why I had to be paused there. I mean, so, I mean, I, so, so I do the psychology thing and then I back up and ultimately create this thing called the garden. Okay. Which is a, and then comes a unified theory of knowledge. Um, and then this thing is called the I quad coin. Okay. Okay. And that's the actual, that then connects communion with the garden. And that's actually uh, the, the I quad stands for the imaginary number to the fourth, which then makes it one. So I to the fourth equals one. Okay. And then it's a sense of oneness. All right. Uh, and then it embedded in this symbol is the one many dialectic. Okay, at for the human. So it's actually in the shape of an H. So if you look at it in a gestalt, it's just an H. And then if you rotate it, it becomes an I. It's an I there. And that stands for your human identity function. Okay. And what this is, is like a psychotechnology to speak to the one and the many and our felt sense of human identity as an individual connecting to a higher collective that's oriented toward wisdom energy underneath the concept of God. <laughs> that's how it works. Wow. 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 <laughs> so that's like, so when you're talking to us, like, yeah, no, that's exactly the path I'm, uh, I'm on. It's wow. amazing. That's that really is interesting. Amazing. How, how, how fabulous. Yeah. Well, you know, my hope is, Greg, is that there's a whole lot of us. Yes. That's who a, are, who are all, you know, if, you know, if, if, you know, if what I'm saying about the individual is that's right. If it's like, okay, so what's, what's the, What's the next collective that's going to be on emergent level, more emergent level? If that's right, and that means un individuals recognizing unity with the universe and each other, then this should be popping out all over the place. And and my issue with 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 where I've come from, it's like you know, you've come more through the science route, yep. and you're addressing this. I've come from more the spiritual route and want to bring that on board. Is like the baggage which I need to address is that anti-world, anti-human, anti-self, all that stuff, which I think w when I said earlier, I think the perennial philosophy idea is now it, I see it differently mm -hmm. rather than seeing it like I did at one time 30 mm -hmm. years ago as the perennial truth. Mm -hmm. It now feels like, oh, a phase we went through, mm -hmm. which was a huge phase and really right. important and led us on and you know da, da, da. but now it's like ah this is the next right. thing can you uh just share with listeners a little mm -hmm. bit about perennial philosophy certainly i know the referent uh, and i know i think i know what you mean but can okay. you say what you yes, have in course, mind of course. when you of course yeah so so the, the 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 term actually goes back to leibniz i think or maybe mm -hmm. even earlier but the person who made it famous is aldous huxley with a yep. book called the perennial philosophy and the essential idea there is that it, and it came from the meeting of all the different cultures that took yep. place in the last 200 years is, oh, there's a commonality. So all of these differences, whether it's Taoism in China or Sufism or Gnosticism, all these mystical traditions all over the world, speaking utterly different languages, literally and also philosophically, mm. 
there's something the same. And what's the same is this waking up to oneness, uh, yeah. compassion. Um, you can frame it yeah. as God or not, but it's, mm-hmm. the, there's, mm-hmm. a, there's, a, yep. there's a similar thing. And he would bring out lots of different themes that were there. And I think that's right. I think there are similar things. They are all different, but yep. there's similar themes. And that brings up this idea, which people really liked. I really liked it. It's like, ah, mm-hmm. oh, there's a perennial truth. Hurrah. You know, yeah. it's like, I can just find it. And we get back to it. And it's the going back idea. We had it and we lost it. Let's get back to it. Whereas now it feels like, no, no, we're going forward to it. We're evolving towards it. And that was a phase. And the positive thing was human beings for the first time had that experience, that oceanic experience. And as I did when I was young, Mm -hmm. it's very natural to think what's in the way is the separateness, Mm -hmm. right? If I want the oneness, get rid of the separateness. I keep on thinking I'm Tim, but really I'm everything. And damn it, this Tim thing's in the way. And I can feel this thing in me and all of that. And, and so it's very natural to think that, but I'm mistaken, I think. Mm. That actually it's the other way around. What we need to do is set up the passivity, the, the habit yes. in oneself to sustain this new level. Totally. And that's the real mission. Wow. I love that. Okay. Uh, I, I often hear the term. So here's actually now a Ford's an absolute way to connect. So I'm I coming from science where I'm sort of skeptical. Then, I, then you hear perennial philosophy. So for me, I hear it often through Wilbur. Wilbur will use the term. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and I can hear it in a particular way through the great chain of being. Okay. Yeah. The great chain of being is part of that. Um, and then the issue there, if you look at the great chain of being, one of the commonalities across is actually they divide the world up into inanimate things, material objects, animate things, living objects, animal things, and persons. Okay, so everywhere you get these four categories. Okay, uh, yeah. so that's the first layers of the four great chains of being. And what Tree of Knowledge tries to do, or really argue, I argue, does effectively is it says, why are these categories everywhere? And what fundamentally are these categories scientifically? Okay. Uh, And we don't, we have now a big history narrative that does say, okay, yes, there's a time by complexification evolution. That's one big, huge, important step. But we actually still haven't gotten what I call the levels and dimensions quite right. Okay. And Tree of Knowledge then updates big history to give us that. And then what you're saying is a relationship once we position ourselves in, and then the issue is, okay, there's this world, and then we need to wake up to the next world, and to achieve unity, we need to leave this behind. And what I'm hearing you saying is like, no, there's this past evolution, and actually, if we wake up together in the portals that we are, appreciate the portal, individual portals that we are, but then afford us to commune with the higher level through that dialectic of one many that maintains us grounded in the world, but it's still sort of oriented toward the spirit, then that is the proper relation. Yeah. So it's turned it. It's turned it around. So, mm-hmm. so the great chain of being, I would say, in most of the older traditions, maybe actually all of them, you get this idea of of emanation. So it right. starts mm-hmm. with you know, there's already right the great spirit, right. and right. then it falls into a lower dimension, and then a lower dimension until eventually it hits the ground. Wilbur yep. still has that in the idea mm-hmm. of yep, totally. Um, in involution. I don't think it's necessary. Yep, I, don't I don't either at all. I think it's a leftover from the past. What we need to do is go, no, it's, that's, it's, it's evolving. It's coming from the simplest through to the more emergent totally. so that what's arising is these higher levels. And therefore it's a much more optimistic. Yep. Um, that fits far more with my actual experience because even when I was a kid, my experience was never, oh, I've left the world behind, hurrah. Mm-hmm. My experience mm-hmm. was the world just came alive. It's now the colors are more colorful. I'm in love right. with it. I'm right. in love with the world. And so it, it was always that. And it feels like, yeah, that's what it is, is it's enlivenment rather than that kind of disembodied enlightenment. Well, I, I would consider, so um, my scientific worldview is what I describe as endonaturalistic. Endo meaning I'm going to create a circle around it. And, and it's the old natural philosophy that Christianity, you know, gave rise to natural philosophy initially. So in the history of ideas, it's like, but there's Christianity, everybody believes in the dual worldview, and then they create natural philosophy, okay? Uh, and my view is always, I'm, I'm a naturalist. And then it's like, okay, but I want to get coherence on that. And I call that endo-naturalism, where I'm basically agnostic about certain fields out higher dimensions, even aliens, so that would make sense in a particular way, you know, past lives, all of that, 
is really incoherent with my endonaturalism. So I want an endonaturalist view, okay? Which just basically means, hey, can we make coherent sense out of the naturalistic worldview that you're describing? And I argue that we can. We, we, we've outlined it. We can actually make it much more coherent. What, 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 I've not quite got that. So the endo, what does the endo mean? Endo simply refers to, let's be clear about what we're claiming. In other words, so somebody, you know, somebody comes to me and says, hey, I know there are aliens out there. Yep. And I'm like, I don't know whether they're aliens. There's a lot of weird shit out there. <laughs> they could okay. be aliens. So there's or not. kind of agnosticism with. But it's that... agnostic in relationship to aliens. Okay. okay. And and then in relationship to gods and reincarnation and psi phenomena, it's kind yep. of agnostic. It basically says those are sort of exo naturalist possibilities. Okay. Yep. Um, and I want to basically bracket them and say, hey, there are a lot of interesting anecdotes, lots of interesting pieces. But by the way, if you actually try to include them, you get a problem with coherence because we actually don't know how to cohere. Well, aliens certainly would make sense in certain ways, but then all this like space time travel, et cetera, the psi phenomenon are complicated in terms of like, how do you make an ontology of that? So I would like to blow that open. That's what I would like to do. Mm. I would like to go, look, it's all natural. And either they exist or they don't. But if yep. they do, then then they're an extension of the same process. Totally. Now, right? now because of the weird life I've led, mm -hmm. I take all those things. Uh, I, I'm a, I, no one could be more conscious. I don't think that no one, but mm -hmm. I am incredibly conscious of spiritual bullshit. I wade mm -hmm. through it every day. I mean, I'm, I, I, you know, it's like, oh my God, I hate it. You know, I, I, I've mm -hmm. lived my life in the world. I have a very low opinion of most spirituality because of it. That's the honest truth. And, but also, it's just so much has happened and, and, and there's some really good people doing really good work. So for me, it's like, okay, I would like to see that included and to see how we can adjust our, our ontology. And, and that's why I think this, this ontology of information and information, I want to say that I know this won't be to you, but to anyone listening to this, when I talk about this information, I don't mean we live in the matrix. You know, that, that would be a reductionist idea. Oh, it's all really just information. It's not really just information. It's really this. Yes. <laughs> this yes. is what it really is. Yeah. But this is a very emergent form of information because that's the totally. lowest category. So mm -hmm. that's the that's the universal language. Like when Carl Jung said, we need a language. You know, matter and the psyche interact. Yep. So so what's the universal language? It's information, mm -hmm. and I think that's the way we can come to an understanding of these other things. Totally. Because if once you've got the idea that the psyche is information on a more emergent level to the to the to the body, yep. Then you can be open to the possibility that okay, so bodies connect, maybe psyches connect. Yep. And if they can share information, well, then you've got the beginnings of an understanding of a whole totally. load of phenomena, which if you reduce it to the biological, you can't understand. So that's more of the... That's you know, exactly. I'm, I mean, I would, uh, I would simply say I'm agnostic about whether or not. So, yes, I completely agree with that ontology. I would, all, I would just add the word energy to information, where energy is sort of the substance marker and ener information actually frames the property forms of that. Uh, of, so it's energy information for me is, is sort of the- Okay, so I, the, I would see energy as a type of information as, so, as, okay. a, as, well, a, can, as a relational property of the universe. Uh -huh. Yeah, no, fair enough. Uh, I think that we could get into the sort of the core meta, but basically everything I'm hearing is, is enormously overlapping. In relationship yeah, I that, agree, I know? agree. It's very um, exciting. It's so, lovely to and the, and the whole idea of, of, of waking up to this and then communing with this higher order and full, and cultivating yeah. that conscious evolution is exactly what I feel like this um, this time is about. Fantastic. I'm so pleased. I'm so, so pleased because it's yeah, so what's really encouraging is that sense of, ah, so, you know, like I said, I wonder how many other people. Yeah, and, actually, and, uh, that was the analogy. Have you ever, you probably have, a uh, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, you know that. Yeah, uh, brilliant. Where, I love it. Really, love well. it. So this is what it feels like, right? At the And, and this is what I mean when I want to say endonaturalism, because I, I'm my science in me, and then my hope for yeah. or whatever, quasi-spiritual, doesn't know what to believe, okay? Yeah, yeah, so I yeah. look around and I'm like, I, I see fellow travelers, and I now feel this kind of like, oh my God, I have this vision, this vision right. of Devil's Mountain equivalent. I was right? gonna, like, uh, you know, it's I a Devil's like, Mountain equivalent. You know? We've both got the same potato mountain. Fucking building our things and you know, and like you've got a potato mountain too. Yeah, it's like exactly. <laughs> like but then you're like, what the hell is that? What kind yeah. and I'm just in awe of it. 
like. Yeah. And so when I say, so to me, it's sort of like my scientist side, I want to say, all right, this is what I know. And I want to create a coherent model. That's why yeah. I grab endo. Okay. Yeah. Because I don't have a scientific description. If there's some ontological force, all right, that is driving this synchronicity, other than just the mere fact that there are all these past potentials that are giving rise to it simultaneously. And because we're in this culture, we happen to see it at the same time and our consciousness are formed. That's, that's still in my endonaturalism, okay? But what if this thing is getting pulled by some other ontological category? Right? Well, what about, what about if, if what's, you know, like, like really pushing the possibility mm -hmm. here of going, look, like the DVD analogy, like, you know, mm -hmm. it's like, but, but unlike the DVD, each level that has emerged is actually organizing the lesser levels yeah. in important ways. Just like, you know, this is physics, but look, I can move it about. Right. <laughs> totally. It's like, one well, should not no. underestimate that. I'm in totally. 10 this, and it's That's moving. It. And that, is, that, that is what the tree of knowledge affords ontologically. It, that, right. it says so, that that is actually happening, and so, I can put that scientifically in an ontological metaphor. So what about if there is now a whole domain mm -hmm. of narrative Yep. Which is what we are. Yep. What we're, this is, and that, because, you know, it's like, we, we, it's like, there is a duality, isn't there? Mm -hmm. we, but it's mm -hmm. emerged. Like, we are experiencing a non spatial, imaginal world right now. Yep. And it's nowhere. It's like your, your body's on one continent, my body's on another continent, but we're meeting in this non spatial, totally. imaginal space. And we exist mostly in it. Yep. Well, what if that, far from being a little bubble around my head and a little bubble around your head, what if it's a whole continent, mm -hmm. a domain of narrative, an ecology of narrative, mm -hmm. like this is a biological ecology, totally. and that ecology of narrative is not only obviously creating culture, which is what mm -hmm. I think you know you've been mm -hmm. pointing to, mm -hmm. but it's actually having an effect on all of the lower levels. Right. So that in a kind of almost like a literal sense, maybe mm -hmm. the, yep. the universe has become a story. Yeah. No, that, that's how we, that's that, how that, we that's a, that, right. That, and that's so I, there's a there. The only question is whether to, to me, if that's just what it is and we're seeing it, actually, that's all part of my endo naturalism. OK. Right. But sometimes I have moments of synchronicity where it's like it's like this thing getting vacuumed into a story. And that's when I become like whoa <laughs> even more like i have like i transform and i am like there's another ontological force i guess that, that i'm like wondering about well that would be the narrative is yeah. the you know mm -hmm. so the, it's the idea look that that mm -hmm. that just as right. my psyche is controlling this bit the right. collective psyche the is actually having an effect now, i can't affect much of my body with my mm -hmm. psyche i can you know move my hands i can use my yep. mouth i yep. can't do much about the rest right. of it. it just it does its own thing mm -hmm. And I imagine that if we think about a collective level, it is also not able to, yep. it's able to affect some. No, I, I, that, and that, I mean, I, that cult, the idea of a collective culture person system that's regulated on the one hand, but is also searching space, imaginal design space, and then collecting particular kinds of, uh, you know, a narrative, negentropic narrative force towards the, uh, you know, some ideal uh, or, you know, which, because there are lots of reasons actually why it would sort of represent a particular, I mean, Don, John talks about like the divine double. Okay. Uh, and and the, this idea you sort of like create, Hey, how could it be great? How could I be better? And then you use that as a lodestar. Okay. Sort of like, Hey, I want to be a better person. We want to be better culture. We want to do this. That process of creating the imaginal is going to have certain kinds of negentropic forms to it. And then, then it projects onto it, and then it pulls the collective narrative space in a particular direction. And maybe, yeah, yeah. yeah. They, the, the, that that's a really that's a really good description of the sort of thing I have in mind. I call it narrativity, um, and it's the it's the way in which narrative plays out. And I, and I the the way I the way I want to see it is and the way I use the word narrativity because it sounded a bit like gravity because I wanted to go look right. We, gravity, whatever it is, is a natural force which does this amazing thing. Yeah. Uh, which seems impossible. You know, it's like it's there and now it's there. Totally. Whoa, what did that? Right. <laughs> you know? And you're left with, and the same thing with that narrative could be the same. Yep. And the, 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 great, the great power of science is it's opened up this, like we've said, this huge understanding on the least emergent levels of reality. 
which is why we've been able to affect them so profoundly, but cut us off from the reality of the most emergent levels. Totally which is where human beings mostly are experiencing this. So if you talk to people who aren't in the scientific world, they're living in their world. Mm -hmm. uh, it's only the people who are caught, who have a particular intellectual mindset right. who would look down on those people mm -hmm. often as ill-informed, which in one way they are. Mm -hmm. And yet they themselves, apart from the fact that most of them live a double life, uh, whereas in their personal life, they're That's one right. thing, in their professional right. life or another. Um, but officially, they're cut off from that. Right. And, and they're now living in a, in a rather, well, I mean, I mean, that's the real thing, isn't it? It's like when we talked at the beginning about it being soul destroying, it's a bleak. bleak it's not, it is not nourishing. It's not really, the core of the heart. Oh God. <laughs> it's, you know, it's, it's so oh, cold and, you know, mm. God. Do you, yeah. given all of your studies, I definitely wanted to check in on this and, uh, uh, it may circle back a little bit, but just spirituality. When you use that term, could you could you uh, share what, some? What the hell do I mean? Yeah, that uh, that kind of deal. It's you know, it's a... yeah. I mean, I mean, it's a difficult word. I find yep. it a difficult word. I've tried to drop it occasionally, okay. um, because it you know it covers everything from awakening to crystals, and <laughs> you know, it, it, so it's everything. Um, what I what I, the way that I kind of mean it myself is the concern with the imaginal. It's like that, but as a, as a reality and as something which you're exploring and that can cover meaning, but it can also cover the nature of death. It can cover the idea that there's something more. It can cover altered states, psychedelics, all the things which gotcha. get bundled together I love it. under that kind of umbrella of spirituality. So that's okay. So that really, that's very, very congruent. Uh, and, and so I have an icon over this, an iconic representation over the garden that I added to. It's called the Elephant Sun God. Okay, it's a picture of the elephant from you know the uh, John Sa Godfrey Sachs poem, "Blind Men and the Elephant." You yeah. know, where everyone grabs. So you put that, and it also then bridges back to some him Hindu symbolism and and all of that. And basically, it's like, hey, here's an integrated pluralistic representation, iconic representation of the idea of God. Okay. And, and that's called the ultimate imaginal in the system. So it's, and it's, it's literally ultimate imaginal, like in the imaginary dimension relative to the real extending out. And then it's putting one's soul in right relationship to that is the spiritual quest. Okay. For, you know, sort of like, hey, like really? how do we get in? And so it's basically trying to create a frame for my embodied psyche to orient toward you know, that which is transcendent in a grounded way. And that's why I'm listening to your system. Like, oh my God. Beautiful. <laughs> Beautiful. Yeah. That's, I, I, no. I, I completely resonate with that, Greg. I think that's what I'm. So how's, to... how's your movement coming in terms of a deeper way of living? You, did you, are you working on a book on this? Where, where, what is your, I am, uh, you know, uh, well, a, I'm working on a, an international I think, community. I think you sound founded I, if, if I saw something like that. It, it, well, it is international. Um, it's, mm -hmm. it's a little small gathering of enthusiasts and explorers. Mm -hmm. Really. We, we meet up online. It's called the international community of you individuals mm -hmm. because it was the ICU. One of the things which we have this <laughs> whole nother subject is a lot of what i've done in the past has been practical mm -hmm. and to help people experience this mm -hmm. individual their individuality you know to experience the universal to get the oneness and uh one of the ways that i've been exploring for 25 years or whatever it is now i don't know mm -hmm. i stumbled on uh is connection the path so rather than individually withdrawing into meditation which is really interesting mm -hmm. actually getting people meditating on each other or connecting Wow. And, uh, and, and my favorite way, because it's just so powerful is what gets called now gazing. So I'll get people, um, like, you know, like if we were here, I, I can look at you and I go, Oh, I see Greg's face. There's that unique, lovely face smiling at me. But then what I'm connecting with is the psyche or soul. I can't see it, mm. but I absolutely know it's there. And I can, I can connect with it. There's no doubt about that. I've been connecting yeah. with it for the last hour and a bit. Deep. And then if I look deeper still, it's like, ah, the universe is looking at itself. Mm. Love it. What's that, that like? And if you sit with those things and with enough people, you get this. So I, I called it the ICU because it's fun. Because <laughs> I, I thought it was fun. So, yeah, that so is fun. I agree. So it's, there's a little thing. And then I'm working on a uh, thing I hope to get out some point next year. I thought it was mm -hmm. going to be done this year. It doesn't look like it. Because I, having done my book Soul Story, which started off this process right. of trying to... Uh, create an, an evolutionary spirituality that worked for me um 
and tied it all together in one narrative. Everything's moved on so far from there over the last sort of five years. It's just been, you know, it sounds like you've had the same thing. And, <laughs> and, and so I now want to articulate that. And it's much, much, much bigger project. I don't know if it's going to be a book. It might be just audio. I don't know how I'm going to do it, but it's, you know, I've got just the most enormous amount of things now that I, and it's about trying to tie. I I feel like there's a vision which I need to articulate before I die for myself as much as anything, which ties together all these things, which have interested me right the way from metaphysics through to politics. Mm. They're all one thing. They're all one thing. Mm. And this individual vision of being individuals conscious of unity has to be rooted in a metaphysics which can accommodate science Mm -hmm. it has to address for me the spirituality of awakening but also around death and these other imaginal experiences and and it needs to be about how we how we relate to each other so i'm gonna i'm I'm having a stab at it it'll be very um idiosyncratic i'm sure but that's my that's my plan and um, i hope i get to do it that's what i'm wonderful man that's a that's really excellent uh it's been a great conversation. Um, the so certainly on that journey, feel free to you know shoot me notes or whatever. Uh, you know the whole uh, you know as I mentioned before. So there's a inside the academy that people don't know unless you're inside is this thing called the problem of psychology, <laughs> and we don't know how to bridge the science of the of behavior with the psyche in any particular way. And I think we've now actually uh, there is an opportunity to do that. And if we get that rotation correct then the project that you're describing becomes, uh, I believe, is deeply connected to that and affords yeah. the capacity to achieve the kind of metaphysics that is up to the task that you are laying out there. So that's a, it's a beautiful task. It's unbelievably crucial. Uh, and it sounds uh, just genuinely inspiring. It really is. And, and, and it's, yeah, it, it is great to, to hear the way that you've developed uh, congruent ideas, Greg. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm very pleased we're in touch. Amen. When you look out at the future, are you on the optimistic side, the pessimistic side? Mixed? Oh, I'm, to... I'm dreadfully optimistic. <laughs> I get that sense. <laughs> I, I mean, that could just be like, you know, a personality trait. But I think it's more than that. I think there's something about the deep awake state. There's something about touching that unisol, God, whatever you call it, the thing which is more was just like it just you know I, I when I, I wrote one of the books my books a long time ago my one of my it was the bestseller actually mm-hmm. on on gnostic christianity and we're talking mm-hmm. about the gnosis this knowing this waking up knowing right, right, right. and at the end i was with my dear friend who i wrote it with peter gandhi and and we were sitting there going look what, what is this gnosis because the thing for us was we were we were exploring it academically but we were also experiencing it exper- mm. exploring it experientially which is kind of different you don't get that in people who normally write about this stuff. Mm-hmm. And, and at the end we went, I think it's something like, you just realize it's all okay. <laughs> <laughs> and it didn't sound very grand, but it really felt like, and that's the that. one thing I need to know. Mm. That's the, you know, to make the hero's journey of a life. Mm-hmm. Mm. If I know that it's all right, even when it's shit, fundamentally it's okay. That something mm-hmm. good is happening. It's going mm-hmm. towards something good. And the experience of having that over the years has just left me with this sense of no, no, it's okay. You know, the, 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 the thing which is evolving. It's okay. Beautiful. All right. Well, that sounds more than okay. <laughs> so uh, anyway, this has been a really uh, inspiring talk. Uh, it really has been, I mean, definitely made my day clearly. Uh, me so too. Thank you so much for, uh, laying that out. I look forward to us, you know, continuing such some really remarkable synergy, synchronicity, both seeing the same thing somehow pulled into this grand conscious narrative. And uh, the more that happens, I think the more it will be okay. I hope the story keeps bringing us back together. Beautiful. All right. Thanks so much, friend. Bye. Take care.